Hello and welcome to this complete Docker course. By the end of this course, you'll have a deep understanding of all the main concepts and also a great big picture overview of how Docker is used in the whole software development process. The course is a mix of animated theoretic explanations, but also hands-on demos for you to follow along. So get your first hands-on experience and confidence using Docker in your projects. So let's quickly go through the topics I'll cover in this course. We will start with the basic concepts of what Docker actually is and what problems it solves. Also, we'll understand the difference between Docker and virtual machine. And after installing Docker, we will go through all the main Docker commands to start and stop containers, debug containers, etc. After that, we'll see how to use Docker in practice by going through a complete workflow with a demo project. So first we'll see how to develop locally with containers. Then we'll run multiple containers or services with Docker Compose. We'll build our own Docker image with Dockerfile and we'll push that built image into a private Docker repository on AWS. And finally, we'll deploy our containerized application. Last but not least, we'll look at how to persist data in Docker, learning the different volume types and afterwards configure persistence for our demo project. If you get stuck anywhere, just comment under the video and I will try my best to answer your questions. Also, you can join the private TechWorld with Nana community group on Facebook, which is there to exchange your knowledge with others and connect with them. If you like the course, by the end of the video, be sure to subscribe to my channel for more related content. So let's get started. So we'll talk about what a container is and what problems it solves. We will also look at a container repository, which is basically a storage for containers. We'll see how a container can actually make the development process much easier and more efficient and also how they solve some of the problems that we have in the deployment process of applications. So let's dive right into it what a container is. A container is a way to package applications with everything they need inside of that package, including the dependencies and all the configuration necessary. And that package is portable, just like any other artifact is. And that package can be easily shared and moved around between a development team or development and operations team. And that portability of containers plus everything packaged in one isolated environment gives it some of the advantages that makes development and deployment process more efficient. And we'll see some of the examples of how that works in later slides. So as I mentioned, containers are portable. So there must be some kind of a storage for those containers so that you can share them and move them around. So Containers live in a container repository. This is a special type of storage for containers. Many companies have their own private repositories where they host or the way they store all the containers. And this will look something like this, where you, you can push all of the containers that you have. But there is also a public repository for Docker containers where you can browse and probably find any application container that you want. So let's head over to the browser and see how that looks like. So if I here search for a Docker Hub, which is the name of the public repository for Docker, I will see this official website. So here, if you scroll down, you see that there are more than 100,000 container images of different applications hosted or stored in this Docker repository. So here you see just some of the examples. And for every application, there's this official Docker container or Docker container image. Um, but if you are looking for something else, you can search it here. And I see there is an official image for, let's say, Jenkins. Uh, but there's also a lot of non-official images or container images that developers or, or, or even from Jenkins itself they actually store it here. So public repository is where you usually get started when you're using or when you're starting to use the containers where you can find any application image. 
So now let's see how containers improve the development process by specific examples. How did we develop applications before the containers? Usually when you have a team of developers working on some application, you would have to install most of the services on your operating system directly, right? For example, you are developing some JavaScript application and you need a PostgreSQL and you need Redis for messaging and every developer in the team would then have to go and install the binaries of those services and configure them and run them on their local development environment. And depending on which operating system they're using, the installation process will look actually different. Also, another thing with installing services like this is that you have multiple steps of installation. So you have a couple of commands that you have to execute and the chances of something going wrong and error happening is actually pretty high because of the number of steps required to install each service. And this approach or this process of setting up a new environment can actually be pretty tedious depending on how complex your application is. For example, if you have 10 services that your application is using, then you would have to do that 10 times on each operating system environment. So now let's see how containers solve some of these problems. With containers, you actually do not have to install any of the services directly on your operating system because the container is its own isolated operating system layer with Linux based image, as we saw in the previous slides, you have everything packaged in one isolated environment. So you have the PostgreSQL with a specific version packaged with the configuration and the start script inside of one container. So as a developer, you don't have to go and look for the binaries to download on your machine, but rather you just go ahead and check out the container repository to find that specific container and download on your local machine. And the download step is just one Docker command, which fetches the container and starts it at the same time. And regardless of which operating system you're on, the command, the Docker command for starting the container will not be different. It will be exactly the same. So if you have 10 applications that your JavaScript application uses and depends on, you would just have to run 10 Docker commands for each container and that will be it. Which makes the setting up your local development environment actually much easier and much more efficient than the previous version. Also, as we saw in the demonstration before, you can actually have different versions of the same application running on your local environment without having any conflict. So now let's see how containers can improve the deployment process. Before the containers, a traditional deployment process will look like this. Development team will produce artifacts together with a set of instructions of how to actually install and configure those artifacts on the server. So you would have a jar file or something similar for your application. And in addition, you would have some kind of a database service or some other service also with a set of instructions of how to configure and set it up on the server. So development team would give those artifacts over to the operations team and the operations team will handle setting up the environment to deploy those applications. Now, the problem with this kind of approach is that, first of all, you need to configure everything and install everything directly on the operating system, which we saw in the previous example that could actually lead to conflicts with dependency versions and multiple services running on the same host. Another problem that could arise from this kind of process is when there is misunderstanding between the development team and operations, because everything is in a textual guide as instructions. So there could be cases where developers forget to mention some important point about configuration, or maybe when operations team misinterpret some of those instructions. And when that fails, the operations team has to go back to the developers and ask for more details. And this could lead to some back and forth communication until the application is successfully deployed on the server. 
with containers, this process is actually simplified because now you have the developers and operations working in one team to package the whole configuration dependencies inside the application just as we saw previously. And since it's already encapsulated in one single environment, and you don't have to configure any of this directly on the server. So the only thing you need to do is run a Docker command that pulls that container image that you've stored somewhere in the repository and then run it. This is of course a simplified version, but that makes exactly the problem that we saw on the previous slide much more easier. No environmental configuration needed on the server. The only thing of course you need to do is you have to install and set up the Docker runtime on the server before you will be able to run containers there. But that's just one time effort. Now that you know what a container concept is, let's look at what a container is technically. So technically a container is made up of images. So we have layers of stacked images on top of each other. And at the base of most of the containers, you would have a Linux based image, which is either Alpine with a specific version, or it could be some other Linux distribution. And it's important for those base images to be small. That's why most of them are actually Alpine because that will make sure that the containers stay small in size, which is one of the advantages of using a container. So on top of the base image, you would have application image. And this is a simplified diagram. Usually you would have these intermediate images that will lead up to the actual application image that is going to run in the container. And of course, on top of that, you'll have all this configuration data. So now I think it's time to dive into a practical example of how you can actually use a Docker container and how it looks like when you install it and download it and run it on your local machine. So to give you a bit of an idea of how this works, let's head over to Docker Hub and search for PostgreSQL. So here, which is a Docker official image, I can see some of the versions and let's say I'm looking specifically for older version, I don't know, nine, six, something. So I'm going to pull that one. So this is a Docker repository so that I can actually go ahead and pull the containers from that repository directly. And because it's a public repository, I don't have to log into it. I don't have to provide any authentication credentials or anything. I can just get started with a simple Docker command without doing or configuring anything to access Docker Hub. So on my terminal, I can just do Docker pull. I can even do Docker run and then just copy the the image name and if i don't specify any version it will just give me the latest but i want a specific version so i'm just i'm gonna go with 9.6 actually just to demonstrate so i can provide the version like this with a column and i can start run so as you see, the first line says unable to find image locally. So it knows that it has to go to Docker Hub and pull it from there. And the next line says pulling from library Postgres. And here you see a lot of hashes that says downloading. And the this is what I mentioned earlier, which is Docker containers or any containers are made up of layers, right? You have the Linux image layer, you have the application layers and so on. So what, what you see here are actually all those layers that are separately downloading from the Docker Hub on my machine, right? And the advantage of splitting those applications in layers is that actually, for example, if the image changes or I have to download a newer version of Postgres, what happens is that the layers, they're the same between those two applications, two versions of Postgres will not be downloaded again, but only those layers that are different. So for example, now it's going to take 
around 10 or 15 minutes to download this one image because I don't have any Postgres locally. But if I were to download the next version, it will take a little bit less time because some layers already exist on my local machine. So now you see that it's already logging because this command that I ran here, the docker run with the container name and version, it fetches or it pulls the, the container, but it also starts it. So it executes the start script right away as soon as it downloads it. And here you see the output of the starting of the application. So it just gives some output about um, starting the server and doing some configuration stuff. And here you see database system is ready to accept connections and launcher started. So now let's open the new tab and see with Docker PS command, you can actually see all the running containers. So here you see that Postgres 9.6 is running and it actually says image. So this is another important thing to understand when we're talking about containers. There are two technical terms, image and a container. And a lot of people confuse those two, I think. And there is actually a very easy distinction between the two. So image is the actual package that we saw in one of those previous slides. So the application package together with the configuration and the dependencies and all these things. This is actually the artifact that is movable around is actually the image container is when I pull that image on my local machine and I actually start it. So the application inside actually starts that creates the container environment. So if it's not running, basically it's an image. It's just an artifact that's lying around. If I start it and actually run it on my machine, it is a container. So that is the distinction. So here it says, the active running containers with a container ID image that it's running from and some entry commands that it executed and some other status information. So this means that PostgreSQL is now running on my local machine. Simple as that. If I were now to uh, need, let's say another version of Postgres to run at the same time on my local machine, I could just go ahead and say, let's go back. And let's say I want to have 9.6 and 10.10 .10 running at the same time on my local machine. I would just do run Postgres. And run again, it doesn't find it locally, so it pushes. And this is what I actually explained to you earlier because it's the same application, but with just a different version. Some of the layers of the image are the same. So I don't have to fetch those again because they are already on my machine and it just fetches the layers that are different. So that saves a little bit of uh, time. And I think it's, it could be uh, actually a good advantage. So now we'll wait for other image layers to load so that we have the second Postgres version running. And now you see, I have Postgres 9.6 running in this uh, command line tab, and I have Postgres version 10.10 .10 running in the next one. So I have two Postgreses with different versions running, and I can actually output them here, and both of them running, and there's no conflict between those two. Like I can actually run any number of applications with different versions, maybe of the same application with no problem at all. And we are going to go through how to use those containers in your application and the port configuration and some of the other configuration stuff later in this tutorial when we do a deep dive. But this is just for you to get the first visual image of how Docker containers actually work, how they look like and how easily you can actually start them on your local machine without having to implement a specific version of Postgres application and do all the configuration yourself.
When I first started learning Docker, after understanding some of the main concepts, my first question was, okay, so what is the difference between Docker and an Oracle uh, virtual box, for example? And the difference is quite simple, I think. And in this short video, I'm gonna cover exactly that. And I'm gonna show you the difference by explaining how Docker works on an operating system level and then comparing it to how virtual machine works. So let's get started. In order to understand how Docker works on the operating system level, let's first look at how operating system is made up. So operating systems have two layers, operating system kernel and the applications layer. So as you see in this diagram, the kernel is the part that communicates with the hardware components like CPU and memory, etc., And the applications run on the kernel layer. So they are based on the kernel. Uh, so for example, we, you all know Linux operating system and there are lots of distributions of Linux out there. There's Ubuntu and Debian and there's Linux Mint, etc. There are hundreds of distributions. They all look different. So the graphical user interface is different. The file system is maybe different. So a lot of applications that you use are different because even though they use the same Linux kernel, they use different or they implement different applications on top of that kernel. So as you know, Docker and virtual machine, they're both virtualization tools. So the question here is what parts of the operating system they virtualize. So Docker virtualizes the applications layer. So when you download a Docker image, it actually contains the applications layer of the operating system and some other applications installed on top of it. And it uses the kernel of the host because it doesn't have its own kernel. The virtual box or the virtual machine on the other hand has the applications layer and its own kernel. So it virtualizes the complete operating system, which means that when you download a virtual machine image on your host, it doesn't use your host kernel, it boots up its own. So what does this difference between Docker and virtual machine actually mean? So first of all, the size of Docker images are much smaller because they just have to implement one layer. So Docker images are usually a couple of megabytes. Uh, virtual machine images, on the other hand, can be a couple of gigabytes large. A second one is the speed. So you can run and start Docker containers much faster than the VMs because they, every time you start them, you ha they have to boot the operating system kernel and the applications on top of it. The third difference is compatibility. So you can run a virtual machine image of any operating system on any other operating system host, but you can't do that with Docker. So what is the problem exactly? Let's say you have a Windows operating system with a kernel and some applications, and you want to run a Linux based Docker image on that Windows host. The problem here is that a Linux based Docker image might not be compatible with the Windows kernel. And this is actually true for the Windows versions below 10 and also for the older Mac versions, which if you have seen how to install Docker on different operating systems, you see that the first step is to check whether your host can actually run Docker natively, which basically means is the kernel compatible with the Docker images. So in that case, a workaround is that you install a technology called Docker Toolbox, which abstracts away the kernel to make it possible for your host to run different Docker images. So in this video, I will show you how to install Docker on different operating systems. The installation will differ not only based on the operating system, but also the version of that operating system. So you can actually watch this video selectively depending on which OS and the version of that OS you have. I will show you how to find out which installation step applies to you in the before installing section, which is the first one. So once you find that out, you can actually directly skip to that part of the video where I explain that into details. I will put the minute locations of each part in the description part of the video. And also I will put all the links that I use in the video in the description um, so that you can easily access them. 
Also, if you have any questions during the video or if you get stuck installing the Docker on your system, please post your question or problem in the comment section so that I can um, get back to you and help you proceed. Or maybe someone from the community will. Uh, so with that said, let's dive right into it. So if you want to install Docker, you can actually Google it and you get an official documentation of Docker. Um, it's important to know that there are two editions of Docker. There is a community and enterprise editions. Um, for us to begin with, community edition will be just fine. In the Docker community edition uh, tab, there, there's a list of operating systems and distributions in order to install Docker. So for example, if we start with Mac, we can click in here and we see the documentation of how to install it on Mac, which is actually one of the easiest, but we'll see some other ones as well. So before you install Docker on your Mac or Windows computer, there are prerequisites to be considered. So for Mac and Windows, there has to be some criteria of the operating system and the hardware met in order to support running Docker. So if you have Mac, go through the system requirements to see if your uh, Mac version is actually supporting Docker. If you have Windows, then you can go to the Windows tab and look at the system requirements there or what to know before you install. For example, one thing to note is that Docker natively runs only on Windows 10. So if you have a Windows version which is less than 10, then Docker cannot run natively on your computer. So if your computer doesn't meet the requirements to run Docker, there is a workaround for that, which is called Docker Toolbox. Instead of Docker, you basically just have to install a Docker Toolbox that will become a sort of a bridge between your operating system and the Docker. And that will enable you to run Docker on your legacy computer. So if that applies to you, then skip ahead in this video to the part where I explain how to install Docker Toolbox on Mac and on Windows. So let's install Docker for Mac. As you see here, there are two um, channels that you can download the binaries from or the application from. We'll go with the stable channel. Another thing to consider, if you have an older version of Mac, either software or the hardware, please go through the system requirements to see if you can actually install Docker. So here there is a detailed description of what Mac version you need um, to be able to run Docker. And also you need at least four gigabytes of RAM. And by installing Docker, you will actually have the whole package of it, which is a Docker engine, uh, which is important or which is uh, necessary to run the Docker containers on your laptop, the Docker command line client, which will enable you to execute some Docker commands. Docker Compose, if you don't know it yet, don't worry about it, but it's just technology to orchestrate if you have multiple containers um, and some other stuff that we're not going to need in this tutorial. But you will have everything in a package installed. So go ahead and download the stable version. Well, I already have Docker installed from the Edge channel, so I won't be installing it again, but it shouldn't matter because the steps of installation are the same for both. So once the Docker DMG file is downloaded, you just double click on it and it will pop up this window. Just drag the Docker well app into the applications and it will be installed on your Mac. As the next step, you will see Docker installed in your applications. So you can just go ahead and start it. So as you see, the Docker sign or icon is starting here. If you click on it, you see the status that Docker is running. And you can configure some preferences and check the Docker version and so on. And if you want to stop Docker or quit it on your Mac, you can just do it from here. 
Um, an important, maybe interesting note here is that if let's say you download or install Docker and if you have uh, more than one accounts on your laptop, you will actually get some errors or conflicts if you run Docker at the same time or multiple accounts. So what I do, for example, is that if I switch to another account where I'm also going to need Docker, I quit it from here and then I start it from other accounts so that I don't get any errors. So that might be something you need to consider if you use multiple accounts. So let's see how to install Docker for Windows. The first step, as I mentioned before, is to go to the before you install section and to see that your operating system and your computer meets all the criteria to run Docker natively. So if you are installing Docker for the first time, don't worry about most of these parts like Docker Toolbox and Docker Machine. There are two things that are important. One is to double check that your Windows version is compatible for Docker. And the second one is to have virtualization enabled. Virtualization is by default always enabled um, other than you manually disabled it. So if you're unsure, then you can check it by going to the task manager, performance, CPU tab. And here you can see the status of the virtualization. So once you have checked that and made sure that these two prerequisites are met, then actually you can scroll up and download the Windows installer for, from the stable channel. Once the installer is downloaded, you can just click on it and follow the installation wizard to install Docker for Windows. Once the installation is completed, you have to explicitly start Docker because it's not going to start automatically. So for that, you can just go and search for the Docker for Windows app on your Windows. Just click on it and you will see the Docker whale icon um, starting. And if you click on that icon, you can actually see the status that says Docker is now up and running. So this is basically it for the installation. Now let's see how to install Docker on different Linux distributions. And this is where things get a little bit more complicated. So first of all, you see that in this menu on the, on the left, you see that for different Linux distributions, the installation steps will differ. But also, for example, if we just click on Ubuntu for the guide, you can see that in the prerequisites section, there is also differentiation between the versions of the same Linux distribution. And there may be some even more complicated scenarios where the combination of the version of the distribution and the architecture it's running in um, also makes some difference into how to set up Docker on that specific environment. Because of that, I can't go through a Docker installation process of every Linux environment because there are just too many combinations. So instead, what we'll do is just go through a general overview of the steps and configuration process to get Docker running on your Linux environment. And you can just adjust it then for your specific setup. So these are some general steps to follow in order to install Docker on your Linux, Linux environment. First of all, it, you have to go through the operating system requirements part on the relevant Linux distribution um, that applies for you. A second step in the documentation to is to uninstall old versions. However, if it's the first time you installing Docker, then you don't have to worry about that. You also don't have to worry about the supported storage drivers and you can skip ahead to the part of installing Docker community edition. So for any Linux distribution here, the steps will be, or the options for installing Docker will be the same. So first option is basically to set up a repository and download the Docker from, and install it from the Docker repository. Um, the second option is to install the packages manually. However, I wouldn't recommend it. And I think the documentation doesn't recommend it either because then you will have to do a lot of steps of the installation and the maintenance of the versions manually. So I wouldn't do that. 
The third one is just for the testing purposes. It may be enough for the development purposes as well, but I would still not do it, which is basically just downloading some automated scripts that will install and set up Docker on your Linux environment. However, again, I wouldn't go with it. I would actually just do the first option, which is just downloading the Docker from the repository. So in order to install Docker using the first option, which is downloading it from the Docker's repositories, you have two main steps. So the first one is to set up the repository, uh, which differs a little bit depending on which distribution you have, and then install the Docker CE from that repository. So from Ubuntu, and Debian, the steps for setting up the repository are generally just updating your app package, then setting up an HTTPS connection with the repository and adding the Docker's official GPG key, which only Ubuntu and Debian need. You don't have to do these um, steps for CentOS and Fedora. There you just have to install the required packages. And the last step, uh, for setting up the repository is basically setting up the stable repository of Docker, which we saw previously on the overview that there are two channels, which is a stable and edge. Here you always have to set up the stable repository. Optionally, you can also set up the edge repository, but I would just do uh, stable this time. And here also something to notice, depending on the architecture, you have to actually set it or you have to set that as a parameter when you set up the repository. So if you have, for example, a different architecture, you can use those steps to display the correct command for it. And um, I guess that applies to other Linux distributions as well. Like for example, here you also have the second tab where you see a separate command for it. So this steps should actually um, set up the repository. So that as a next step, you can then install the Docker C from those repositories. So installing Docker from the setup repository is actually pretty straightforward. The steps are same for or similar to all the distributions. Basically just update the app package and then you just say install Docker CE. So this command will just download the latest Docker version. If you want to install a specific one, which you will need to do in a production environment, then you can just uh, provide a version like this to just say docker minus CE equals some specific versions. And using this command, you can actually look up what versions are available in that repository that you just, and with this command, actually Docker will be installed um, on your Linux environment. And then you can just verify using sudo docker run hello world, which is this demo image of Docker. You can verify that Docker is running and this will start hello world Docker container on your environment. So as I mentioned previously for environments um, that do not support running Docker natively, there is a workaround which is called Docker Toolbox. So Docker Toolbox is basically an installer for Docker environment setup on those systems. So this is how to install uh, Docker Toolbox on your Mac. Um, this is the whole package that comes with the installation of Docker Toolbox, which is basically the Docker command line, Docker machine, Docker compose, basically all the packages that we saw in the native installation. And in, on top of that, you also get the Oracle VM virtual box. So in order to install the Docker toolbox, it's actually pretty straightforward. On this website, you can go to the toolbox releases. We have all the list of latest releases. You just take the uh, latest release and here you see two assets. This one is for Windows, obviously, and you just download the package for Mac. 
and once it's downloaded you just click on it and go through the installation wizard leave all the options by default as they are do not change anything and after the installation you can just validate that the installation is successful and you can actually run docker so after seeing the installation was successful screen just go and look up in your launchpad docker quick start terminal and once you open it, you should be able to run uh, Docker commands. And you can just try Docker run hello world, which should just start up or bring up um, this hello world Docker container on your environment. So now let's see how to install Docker toolbox on Windows. Here you see that you get the whole package of Docker technologies with a toolbox, which are basically the same package which you get on the uh, native Docker installation. And on top of that, you get Oracle VM VirtualBox, which is the tool that enables Docker to run on an older system. So before you install Docker Toolbox, you have to make sure that you meet some of the preconditions. Number one, you have to make sure your Windows system supports virtualization and that virtualization must be enabled. Otherwise, Docker, Docker won't start. So depending on which Windows version you have, looking up or checking the virtualization status will be different. So I just su suggest you Google it and look it up of how to find the virtualization status to see that it's enabled. Once you have that checked, also make sure that your Windows operating system is 64 bits. So if those two criteria are met, then you can go ahead and install the Docker toolbox. The place where you see the releases or the release artifacts is toolbox releases link here which I have open. So it's basically a list of the releases. You just take the latest one, which has two artifacts. This is the one for Windows. You just download this executable file, click on it and go through the installation wizard. Once the installation is completed, there are just a couple of steps here. You can verify that Docker was installed or the toolbox was installed by just looking up the Docker quick start terminal on your Windows. That app must be installed. And once you click on it and open it, you should be able to run Docker commands in the terminal. So the basic Docker command that you can test will be docker run hello world, which will just fetch this basic uh, Docker container from the public registry and run it on your computer. If that command is successful, it means that Docker was successfully installed on your computer. And now you can proceed with the tutorial. So in this video, um, I'm going to show you some basic Docker commands. At the beginning, I'm going to explain what the difference between container and image is, because that's something a lot of people confuse, then very quickly go through version and tag, and then show you a demo of how to use the basic Docker commands. Um, commands that will be enough to pull an image locally, to start a container, to configure a container, and even debug the container. So with that said, let's get started. So what is the difference between container and image? Mostly people use those terms interchangeably, but actually there is a fine difference between the two. To see theoretically, container is just the part of a container runtime. So container is the running environment for an image. So as you see in this graphic, the application image that runs the application, it could be Postgres, Redis, some other application, needs, let's say, a file system where it can save the log files or where it can store some configuration files. It also needs some environmental configuration like environmental variables and so on. So all of this environmental stuff are provided by container. And container also has a port that is binded to it, uh, which makes it possible to talk to the application which is running inside of a container. And of course, it should be noted here that the file system is virtual in the container. So the container has its own abstraction of an operating system, including the file system and the environment, which is, of course, different from the file system and environment of the host machine. So in order to see the difference between container and image in action, let's head over to the Docker Hub and find, for example, a Redis image. Another thing is that Docker Hub, all the artifacts 
that are in the Docker Hub are images. So we're not talking about containers here. All of these things are images, Docker official image. So we're going to go ahead and pull a Redis image out of the Docker Hub to my laptop. So you see the different layers of the image are downloaded. And this will take a couple of minutes. So once the download is complete, I can check all the existing images on my laptop using Docker images command. So I see I have two images, Redis and Postgres with text, image IDs and so on. Another important aspect of images is that they have tags or versions. So for example, if we go back to the Docker Hub, each one, each image that you look up in the Docker Hub uh, will have many different versions. The latest is always the one that you get when you don't specify the version. Of course, if you have a dependency on a specific version, you can actually choose the version you want and specify it. And you can select one from here. So this is what you see here. The tag is basically the version of the image. So I just downloaded the latest and I can also see the size of the image. So now to this point, we have only worked with images. There is no container involved and there is no Redis running. So now if, let's say I need Redis running so that my application can connect to it. I'll have to create a container of that Redis image that will make it possible to connect to the Redis application. And I can do it by running the Redis image. So if I say docker run Redis, this will actually start the image in a container. So as I said before, container is a running environment of an image. So now if I open a new tab and do docker ps, I will get status of all the running Docker containers. So I can see the container Redis is running with a container ID based on the image of Redis and some other information about it. For example, the port that it's running on and so on. So as you see here, the docker run redis command will start the redis container in the terminal um, in an attached mode. So for example, if I were to terminate this with a control C, you see that redis application stops and the container will be stopped as well. So if I do docker ps again, I see that no container is running. So there is an option for docker run command that make, makes it able, makes it possible to run the container in a detached mode, and that is minus D. So if I do docker run minus D Redis, I will just get the ID of the container as an output, and the container will stop running. So if we check again, docker ps, I see the container with the ID starting with 838, which is the same thing here, is running. So this is how you can start it in a detached mode. Now, for example, if you would want to restart a container because I don't know, some uh, the application crashed inside or some error happened, so you want to restart it, you would need the doc container ID. So just the first part of it, not the whole string. And you can simply say docker stop ID of the container and that will stop the docker container. Nothing running. If you want to start it again, you can use the same ID to start it again. So let's say you stop a Docker container. At the end of the day, you go home, you come back the next day, open your laptop, and you want to restart the stopped container, right? So if you do Docker PS, there is, uh, the output is empty, you don't see any containers. So what you can do, alternative to just looking up your history, command line history, is you can do docker ps minus a, which will show you 
all the containers which uh, are running or not running. So here you see the container ID again, and you can restart it. Okay, so let's try another thing. Let's say you have two parallel applications that both use Redis, but in different versions. So you would need two Redis containers with different image versions running on your laptop, right? At different times maybe, or at the same time. So here we have the latest one, which is Redis 506. And let's head over to the Docker Hub and select uh, version. Let's say you need version 4.0. So remember the first time that we downloaded the Redis image, we did Docker pull Redis. Um, however, if you run Docker, if you use Docker run with Redis image and the tag, which was 4.0, it will pull the image and start the container right away after it. So it does two commands basically in one. So it's docker pull that docker start in one command. So if I do this, it says it can't find the image locally. So it goes and pulls the image from the repository to my laptop. And again, we see some layers are downloaded and the container is started right away. And now if I do Docker PS, you see that I have two Redis's running. So this is where it gets interesting. Now, how do you actually use any container that you just started? So in this output, we, you also see the ports section, which specifies on which port the container is listening to the incoming requests. So both containers open the same port, which is what was specified in the image. So in the logs of the container, you can see the information running modes and loan port 6379. So how does that actually work? And how do we not have conflicts while both are running on the same port? So to explain that, let's head over to our slide and see how this works. As you know, container is just a virtual environment running on your host and you ha can have multiple containers running simultaneously on your host, which is your laptop, PC, whatever you're working on. And your laptop has certain ports available that you can open for certain applications. So how it works is that you need to create a so-called binding between a port that your laptop, your host machine has and the container. So for example, in the first container part here, you see container is listening on port 5000 and you bind your laptop's port 5000 to that containers. Now you will have conflict if you open two 5000 ports on your host because you will get a message, the port is already bound or is already in use, you can do that. Um, however, you can have two containers, as you see in the second and third containers are both listening on port 3000, which is absolutely okay, as long as you bind them to two different ports from your host machine. So once the port binding between the host and the container is already done, you can actually connect to the running container using the port of the host. So in this example URI, you would have some app, local host, and then the port of the host. And the host then will know how to forward the request to the container using the port binding. So if we head back, here you see that containers have their ports and they're both running on the same one. However, we haven't made any binding between my laptop's port and the container port. And because of that, the container is basically unreachable by any application, so I won't be able to use it. So the way we actually do that is by specifying the binding of the ports during the run command. So I'm gonna break this and check that there is just one container running now. I'm gonna 
stop the other one as well so we can start the menu okay so we see both containers are here so now we want to start them using the binding between the host and the container ports but again we have two redises so we need to bind them to two different ports on my laptop so the way to do it is you do docker run and you specify with minus p the port of the host that's the first one so let's go with 6000 it doesn't really matter in this case and the second one is the port that you're binding this to which is the container port so we know the container port will be 6379 and this is where we bind our so my laptop's port 6002 and if i do this i forgot where it is here so and now if i do docker ps let's actually clean this docker ps again here you see the binding here All right so your laptop's 6000 port is bound to the containers 6379 so now let's do another thing and let's start it in a detached mode so like this let's check again it's running again and now i want to start the second container let's clear this again So here you see it created a bunch of containers because uh, when I specified different options with the port binding, it actually created new containers. Um, that's why you see a couple of more here. So I'm going to copy the image name with the tag for uh, .o minus p. So for example, if I were to do this now, and I would try to run the other redis the second redis container with the same port on my laptop i would get an error saying the port is already allocated so i can do 6001 and run it again i'll run it in detached mode so that i don't see port and if i go over here and say docker ps i see that I have two different Redis versions running, both of them bound to different ports on my laptop and the containers themselves listening to requests on the same port. So, so far we have seen a couple of basic Docker commands. We have seen Docker pull, which pulls the image from the repository to local environment. We also saw run, which basically combines docker pull and docker start, pulls the image if it's not locally available and then starts it right away. Then we saw docker start and docker stop, which makes it possible to restart a container if um, you made some changes and you want to um, create a new version, which makes it possible to restart a container if you need to. Um, we also saw docker run with options the one option that we saw was D minus D, which is detach. So you can run the container in detached mode so you can use terminal again. Minus P allows you to bind port of your host to the container. So very important to remember minus P, then comes the port of your host and then comes the port of your um, container, whatever it might be. We also saw docker ps, docker ps minus a, which basically gives you all the containers, no matter if they're running currently or not. We also saw docker images, which gives you all the images that you have um, locally. So for example, if after a couple of months, you decide to clean up your space and get rid of some stale images, you can actually check them, check the list and then go through them and uh, delete them. You can do the same with stale Docker containers that you don't use anymore or you don't need anymore. You can also get rid of them. So the final part of the Docker basic commands 
are commands for troubleshooting, which are very, very useful. If something goes wrong in the container, you want to see the logs of the container, or you want to actually get inside of container, get the terminal and execute some commands on it. So let's see Docker PS. We have two containers running, right? Now we don't have any output. We don't see any logs here. So let's say something um, happens. Your application cannot connect to Redis and you don't know what's happening. So ideally you would want to see what logs Redis container is producing, right? The way to do that is very easy. You just say Docker logs and you specify the container ID and you see the logs. You can also do the doc logs if you don't want to uh, remember the container ID or do Docker PS all the time. You can remember the name of the container and you can get the logs using the name. So a little side note here, um, as we're talking about the names of the containers. So here, as you see, when a container is created, you just get some random name like this. So you can name your containers as you want um, using another option of the Docker run, which might be pretty useful sometimes if you don't want to work with the container IDs and you just want to remember the names um, or if you just want to differentiate between the containers. So for example, let's create a new container from Redis 4.0 image using a different name that we choose. So I'm going to stop this container and I'm going to create a new one from the same image. So let's run it in the detached mode. Let's open the port. 1001, 2, 6, 3, 7, 9. And give the name to the container. And let's call, since it's the older um, version, let's call it Redis older and we need to specify the image. So remember, this will create a new container since we're running the docker run command again. So if we execute this and check again, we see the Redis 4.0 image based container is created, which is um, fresh new, you can see in the created and the name is Redis older and we can do the same for the other container so that we kind of know which uh, container is what. So I'll stop this one and I will use the same command here. This will be the latest and I will call this Redis latest. And since bind another port, so I'm going to run it and let's see. So here I have to containers running. Now I know Redis older, Redis latest. So for example, if the older version has some problems, I can just do logs Redis older and I can get my logs. So another very useful command in debugging is docker exec. So what we can do with docker exec is we can actually get the terminal of a running container. So let's check again. We have two containers running and let's say there is some problem with the latest Redis latest container. And I want to get a terminal of that container and do maybe navigate a directory inside, check uh, the log file, or maybe check the configuration file or uh, print out the environmental variables. Um, whatever. So in order to do that, we use docker exec command with minus T, which stands for interactive terminal. Then I specify the container ID. And I say in bash. So I get the bash. And here you see that the, the cursor changed. So I'm inside of the container as a root user. And here, if I say ls, okay, the date is empty. I can also print out in which directory I am. I can go to the home directory, see what's there. Um, so I have my virtual file system inside of a container. And here I can um, navigate the different directories and I can check stuff. I can also print all the environmental variables to see that something is set correctly um, and do all kinds of stuff here. And this could be really useful um, if you have a container with uh, some 
complex configuration or if for example you are running your own application that you wrote in a container and, and you have some complex configuration there um, or some kind of setup and you want to validate that everything um, is correctly set in order to exit the terminal you just do exit and you're out you can also do the same using the name again if you don't want to work with the ids and you just want to remember the names of the container to make it easier you can do it with the name as well same thing since most of the container images are based on some lightweight linux distributions you wouldn't have much of the linux um, commands or applications installed here. For example, you wouldn't have curl or some other stuff. So you are a little bit more limited in that sense. So you can execute a lot of stuff from the Docker containers. For most of the debugging work, um, it should be actually enough. So the final part to review the difference between Docker run and Docker start, which might be confusing for some people. Let's revisit them. So basically Docker run is where you create a new container from an image. So Docker run will take an image with a specific version or just latest, right? As option or as an attribute. With Docker start, you're not working with images, but rather with containers. So for example, um, as we saw, Docker run has a lot of options. You specify with minus D and minus P, the port binding, and then you have this name of the container and all this stuff. So basically you tell Docker at the beginning what kind of container with what attributes, name, and so on to create from a specific image. But once the container is created, and you can see that using the, con uh, the command, so for example, here, the last ones that we created, and if you stop it and you want to restart it, you just need to use the command docker start and specify the container ID. And when you start it, the container will retain all the attributes that we defined when creating the container using docker run. So docker run is to create a new container. Docker start is to restart a stopped container. So once you've learned the Docker basic concepts and understood how it works, uh, it's important to see how Docker is actually used in practice. So in software development workflow, you will know you have this uh, classical steps of development and you have continuous delivery or continuous integration uh, and then eventually it gets deployed on some environment, right? It could be a test environment, develop environment. So it's important to see how Docker actually integrates in all of those steps. So in the next couple of videos, I'm going to concentrate exactly on that. So we're going to see some overview of the flow and then we're going to zoom in on different parts and see how Docker is actually used in those individual steps. So let's consider a simplified scenario where you are developing a JavaScript application on your laptop, right? On your local development environment. Your JavaScript application uses a MongoDB database. And instead of installing it on your laptop, you download a Docker container from the Docker Hub. So you connect your JavaScript application with the MongoDB and you start developing. So now let's say you develop the application, first version of the application locally, and now you want to test it or you want to deploy it on the uh, development environment where a tester in your team is going to test it. So you commit your JavaScript application in Git or in some other version control system uh, that will trigger a continuous um, integration, a Jenkins build or whatever you have configured and Jenkins build will produce artifacts from your application. So first it will build your JavaScript application and then create a Docker image out of that JavaScript artifact, right? So what happens to this Docker image once it gets created by Jenkins build, it gets pushed to a private Docker repository. So usually in a company, you would have a private repository because you don't want other people to have access to your images. So you push it there. And now as a next step, 
could be configured on Jenkins or some other scripts or tools, that Docker image has to be deployed on a development server. So you have a development server that pulls the image from the private repository, your JavaScript application image, and then pulls the MongoDB that your JavaScript application depends on from a Docker hub. And now you have two containers, one your custom container and a publicly available MongoDB container running on dev server. And they talk to each other. You have to configure it, of course. They talk and communicate to each other and run as an app. So now if a tester, for example, or another developer logs in to a dev server, they, be, they will be able to test the application. So this is a simplified workflow, how Docker will work in a real life development process. In the next videos, I'm going to show you hands-on demo of how to actually do all of this in practice. So in this video, we are going to look at some practical example of how to use Docker in a local development process. So what we're going to do is a simple demo of a JavaScript and Node.js application in the backend to simulate the local development process. And then we're going to connect it to a Docker container with a MongoDB database in it. So let's get started. So in this video, we're going to see how to work with Docker containers when developing applications. So the first step will be is we're going to develop a very simple UI backend uh, application using JavaScript, very simple HTML structure and Node.js in the backend. And in order to integrate all of this in the database, we are going to use a Docker container of a MongoDB database and um, also to make working with the MongoDB much easier so we don't have to execute commands in, a, in the terminal, we're going to deploy a Docker container of a Mongo UI, which is called the Mongo Express, where we can see the database structure and all the updates that our application is making in the database. So this development setup should give you an idea of um, how Docker containers are actually used in the development process. So I've already prepared some very simple JavaScript application. Um, so in order to see the code, basically we have this index HTML that is very simple code and we have some JavaScript here and we're using Node.js backend that just serves that index HTML file and listens on port 3000. So we have the server running here in the backend and we have the UI that looks like this. So basically it's just the user profile page with some user information and user can edit their profile. So if I, for example, change the name here um, and if I change the email address and do changes like this, I can save my profile and I have my updates here. Um, however, if I refresh the page, of course the changes will be lost because it's just JavaScript Node.js. So there is no persistent component in this application. So in order to have that, which is actually how real life applications work, you'll know that you need to integrate the application with a database. So using that example, I will try to showcase you how you can actually use the Docker containers to make the development process easier by just pulling one of the databases and attaching it or connecting it to the application. So in this case, we're going to go with the MongoDB application. And uh, in addition to MongoDB container, we're going to also deploy a MongoDB UI, which is its own container. It's called Mongo Express, where we can manage or see the database insights and updates from our application much easier. So now let's see how that all works. So in order to get started, let's go to Docker Hub and find our uh, MongoDB image. Here, let's go to Mongo and we have MongoDB here. Actually, let's end the Mongo Express, which is another Docker container that we're going to use for the UI. So first, let's pull the MongoDB official image. So I, I already have MongoDB latest, so pulling doesn't take longer. 
on my laptop, but you're gonna need a couple of seconds probably. And the next one we're gonna pull is the Docker Express, which I also have, I believe. So let's see. Yes, it's also fast. So if I check locally, I have MongoDB and Mongo Express images. So the next step is to run both Mongo and Mongo Express uh, containers in order to make the MongoDB database available for our application and also to connect the Mongo Express with the MongoDB container. So let's do the, the connection between those two first. In order to do that, we have to understand another Docker concept, Docker Network. So how it works is that Docker creates its isolated Docker network where the containers are running in. So when I deploy two containers in the same Docker network, in this case, Mongo and Mongo Express, they can talk to each other using just the container name without local host, port number, etc. just the container name because they're in the same network. And the applications that run outside of Docker, like our Node.js, which just runs from Node server, is gonna connect to them from outside or from the host using localhost and the port number. So later when we package our application into its own Docker image, what we're gonna have is again, a Docker network with MongoDB container, Mongo Express container, and we're gonna have a Node.js application which we wrote including the index.html and JavaScript for frontend in its own Docker container, and it's gonna connect to the MongoDB. And the browser, which is running on the host, but outside the Docker network is gonna connect to our JavaScript application, again, using host name and the port number. So Docker by default already provides some networks. So if we say Docker network ls, we can already see these auto-generated Docker networks. So we have four of them with different names and the drivers, we're not gonna go into details here, but what we're gonna do is create its own network for the MongoDB and the Mongo Express, and we're gonna call it Mongo Network. So let's do this right away. I'm gonna say Docker Network Create, and we're gonna call it Mongo Network. So now if I do docker network ls again, I see my docker network has been created. So now in order to make our MongoDB container and the Mongo Express container run in this Mongo network, we have to provide this network option when we run the container in the docker run command. So let's start with the Mongo. So we all know that docker run is the command to start a container from an image, right? So we have docker run mongo, which is the basic docker run command. However, in this case, we want to specify a couple of things. Um, as you learned from the previous videos, you have to specify something called port. So we need to open a port of MongoDB. The default port of MongoDB is 27,017. So we'll take that port actually for both host and container. So Mongo will run uh, at this port inside of a container and we open the same port on the host. So that will take care of the port. Then we will run it in a detach mode. In addition to that, there are a couple of things that we can specify when starting up the container. And these are environmental variables of the MongoDB. Let's see. Um, in the official image description, you actually have a couple of documentation about how to use the image, which is very helpful to kind of understand what kind of configuration you can uh, apply to it. Here you see some environmental variables. So basically on startup, you can define what the root username and the password will be, which is very uh, handy because we're gonna need those two for the express to connect to the Mongo and you can also specify the init database. We're just gonna provide the username and password because we can create the database from the Mongo Express UI later. So let's do that. And the way you can specify the environmental variables you can actually see here as well is by just, let's copy this one. So here, 
you say environmental variable, that's what the minus E flag stands for. And root username, we'll say it's admin. And another variable, which is the password, will be just password. So in this way, we can actually override what the default username and password will be. So two more things that we need to configure in this uh, command are container name, because we're going to need that container name to connect with the Mongo Express. So we'll call this one Mongo DB, let's say. And another one we need is the network that we created, which was called Mongo Network. So in order to make this command a little bit more structured, do it on multiple lines. So let's see. So it's more readable. So basically all these options or all these flags that we set um, to go one more time through them, it, it's going to start in de detached mode. Uh, we are opening the port on the host, um, username and password that we want uh, MongoDB to use uh, in the startup process. We're going to rewrite or overwrite the name of the container. And this container is going to run in a Mongo network and this should actually start the container. Okay, so if you want to see whether it was successful, we can log the container and see what's happening inside. So as we see, Mongo was started and everything actually looks good. Waiting for connections on port 27,017. Okay, so now let's start Mongo Express. We want Mongo Express to connect to the running MongoDB container on startup. And here we have an example of how to run it. And here we have the list of environmental variables that we can configure. So let's quickly look at them. Username, password, we don't need them. However, we need the admin username and admin password of the MongoDB. This is actually what we overwrote with admin and password. So we're going to use them because Express will need some username password to authenticate with the MongoDB and to connect it. The port is by default the correct one, so we don't need to change that. Um, and this is an important part. This is the MongoDB server, right? So basically, this is the container name that Express will use to connect to the Docker. And because they are running in the same network, only because of that, this configuration will work. If I didn't, if I hadn't specified the network, then I could have, I could specify the name, correct name here of the container, but it wouldn't work. So with that said, let's actually create the Docker run command for Express as well. So let's clear the history and let's start. So again, we run in a detached mode and let's see what parameters we need. So first of all, port, let's say we, what is the default port that Express runs on? That's 80, 81. So we'll take that. So basically it's gonna run on our laptop on port 8081. The next option would be these two. And remember, environmental variables need to be specified with minus E. And this is the username of MongoDB admin, which is admin, because we specified it when we started the MongoDB container. This is the password. Let's set this one as well. Don't forget the network, minus minus net Mongo network. We have the name, we can also call it Mongo Express. And let's see what else we might need here. Yes, this is important one. Um, and our container name, let's actually see it again. Docker PS, the one running. It's called MongoDB. That's the container name. And this is what we need to specify here. So I'm going to write this here. And finally, the image is called Mongo Express. So I'm just going to copy this one here. And that is it. So basically, with these commands, Doc Mongo Express should be able to connect to the MongoDB container. So let's run it and 
just to make sure, let's log the container and see what's happening there. Waiting for MongoDB. Welcome to Mongo Express. It looks like it connected successfully. Um, it says here database connected and the Mongo Express is available at port 8081. So let's check the Mongo Express out at the port 8081. So actually let's close these tabs. We don't need them anymore. And here, if I say localhost 8081, I should be able to see the Mongo Express. So these are the databases that already exist by default in Mongo or which are created on startup. And using the UI, we can create our own database. As we saw previously, we could have specified an environmental variable initDB on MongoDB startup, and that would have created a new database. However, it doesn't matter. We will just create a database name here. So we will call it user um, account database. So let's create one. And now we can actually use it or connect to this database from Node.js. So let's see how that works. So now we have the MongoDB container and the Mongo Express container running. So let's check that we have both of them. We'll have to connect Node.js with the database. So the way to do it is usually to give a protocol of the database and the URI. And the URI for a MongoDB database would be localhost and the port that it's accessible at. I already went ahead and prepared the code for Node.js. So basically we are gonna use a Mongo client here, which is a node module. And using that Mongo client, we are connecting to the MongoDB database. So this is the protocol, the host and the port that we just saw that the MongoDB is listening at and username and password of the root user of MongoDB. Of course, usually you wouldn't put the password here or not use an admin or root uh, username password to connect to a database, but this is for just the demonstration purposes. And these are username and password that we set as environmental variables when we created the Docker MongoDB container. So let's check that. So this is the MongoDB uh, container command, and this is the username root and root password that we specified. And this is what we are gonna use in the code. As I said, for demonstration purposes, I will write the password directly here. So then we connect to the database. Um, so I also went ahead and in the Mongo Express, user account database and inside that I created a collection which is like a table in MySQL world called users. So here I connect to a user account database and I query the collection users. And this is a get request so I'm just fetching something from the database and this is update uh, request same thing. I connect to the database using the same URI and the database name and I update or insert something in the collection. So now let's see how all that works. So let's head over to the UI. So in the user's collection, there is no data, it's empty. So we're gonna refresh it and edit the data. So I'm gonna write here some and update it and refresh. We see that a new insert was made. So this is the update profile section here. So all this was executed, it connected to the MongoDB and now we have one entry, which is email coding name that we changed. So if I'm gonna refresh it now, I fetched a newly inserted user data in the UI and I displayed it here. And also if you wanna see what the MongoDB container actually logs during this process, we can actually look at the logs. So I'm gonna say docker ps and log using the container ID. So let's say if I wanted to see just the last part of it, because I want to see what the last activity was, I can also, let's clear this and I can also do tail. So I can just display the, the last part of it. Or if I wanted, I could also stream the logs. So I'll clear this again and I will say stream the logs. So I won't have to do Docker logs all the time. So if I make a line here, for example, to mark the last logs, I can refresh it. Let's make some other changes. Let's 
change it to petals and save profile. So I'm going to see some activity here as well. So these connections are new and it also says received client metadata. And this is where the Node.js request comes in with the Node.js and its version. And at the end of each communication, there is an end connection because we end the database connection at the end. So we see that also in the logs. So if, for example, something wasn't working properly, you could always check them in the logs here. So with that, I have a fully functional JavaScript Node.js application, which has a persistence in the MongoDB database. And we also have uh, Mongo UI, both of them running in a Docker container. So this would be uh, somehow a realistic example of how local development using Docker containers would look like. So in the last video, we created and started two Docker containers, MongoDB and MongoExpress. And these are the commands that we used to make it happen, right? The first, we created a network where these two containers can, can talk to each other using just the container name and no host, port, etc. is necessary for that. Um, and then we actually ran two Docker run commands with all the uh, options, environmental variables, etc. set. Now, uh, this way of starting containers all the time is a little bit tedious and you don't want to execute these run commands all the time on the command line terminal, especially if you have a bunch of Docker containers to run, you probably want to automate it or just make it a little bit easier. And there's a tool that's, that makes running multiple Docker containers with all this configuration much easier than with Docker run commands. And that is Docker Compose. If you already know Docker Compose and you were wondering why is it useful and what it actually does, then bear with me in the next slide, I'm gonna explain that. So this is a Docker run command of the MongoDB that we executed previously. So basically with Docker Compose file, what we can do is we can take the whole command with its configuration and map it into a file so that we have a structured commands. So if you have, let's say 10 Docker containers uh, that you want to run for your application and they all need to talk to each other and interact with each other, you can basically write all the run commands for each container in a structured way in the Docker compose. And we'll see how that structure actually looks like. So, on the right side in the Docker Compose example, the first two tags are always there, right? Version three, that's the latest version of the Compose, uh, Docker Compose, and then we have the services. This is where the container list goes. So the first one is MongoDB, and that maps actually to the container name, right? This is gonna be a part of container name when Docker creates a container out of this configuration blueprint. The next one is actually the image, right? So we need to know which image that container is going to be built from. And of course, you can specify a version tag here um, next to the name. The next one is port. So we can also specify which ports is going to open. First one is on the host and the second one after the colon is on the container. So the port mapping is there. And of course, the environmental variables can be also mapped in the Docker Compose. And this is how actually the structure of Docker Compose looks like for one specific commands. Let's actually see the second container command for Mongo Express that we executed and how to map that. So now again, we have a Docker run command for Mongo Express and let's see how we can map it into a Docker Compose. So as I said, services will list the containers that we want to create and again, names Mongo Express will map to, map to the container name. The next one will be the image. Again, you can add a tag here if you want to be um, have a specific one. Then you have the ports 80 to 8080. And then you have all the environmental variables again, under the attribute environment. And this is how the Docker compose will look like. So basically Docker Compose is just a structured way to contain very normal common Docker commands. And of course it's, it's gonna be easier for you to edit 
the, the file, uh, if you want to change some variables or if you want to change the ports, or if you want to add some new options to the run command, so to say. And maybe you already noticed the network configuration is not there in the Docker Compose. So this Mongo network that we created, we don't have to do it in a Docker Compose. If we go to the next slide, because we have the same concept here, we have containers that will talk to each other using just the container name. So what Docker Compose will do is actually take care of creating a common network for these containers. So we don't have to create the network and specify in which network these containers will run in. And we're gonna see that in action right away. So let's actually create a Docker Compose file. So I'm gonna paste all my contents here. And this is exactly what we saw on the slides. And I'm gonna save it as a Mongo YAML. And we see the highlighting as well. Be very aware of the indentation. They have to be correct. So this is the list of all the containers on the same level and then each container has its configuration inside that. So now compared to Docker run commands, it will be very easy for me to go here and change these environment variables or add some new configuration options, etc. So here again for demonstration, we actually save the Docker Compose in the code. So it's part of the application code. So now that we have a Docker Compose file, the question is, how do I use it? Or how do I start the containers using that? So let's go to the command line and start Docker containers using this Docker Compose file. So the way to use it is using Docker Compose command. Now, if you've installed Docker on your laptop, it usually gets installed with the Docker Compose packaged inside. So you should have both Docker and Docker Compose commands installed as a package. So Docker Compose command takes an argument, which is the file. So I'm going to specify which file I want to execute. And in my case, it's called Mongo YAML. And at the end, I want to say what I want to do with this file. In this case, the command is up, which will start all the containers which are in the Mongo YAML. So let's actually check before that there, there are no containers running. So I don't have anything running here and I'm going to start those two containers. Okay, so there are a couple of interesting things here in this output. So let's scroll all the way up. So we've talked about Docker network and how we created our own network at the beginning to run the containers inside. And I said that Docker Compose takes care of it. And here we see the output where it actually created a network called my app default. This is the name of the network and it's going to run those two containers. These are actually the names of the containers that Docker Compose created. This is what we specified. And it just added prefix and suffix to it. And it created those two containers uh, in that network. So if I actually go here and do docker network ls, I see the my app default is here. So that's one important thing. Another one is the logs of both containers actually mixed because we're starting both at the same time. As you see, the Mongo Express has to wait for MongoDB to start because it needs to establish a connection. So we here see the logs. So MongoDB is starting. We still get connection refused because it's not started uh, completely. And somewhere here, when MongoDB is started and listening for connections, Mongo Express is able to connect to it. So this is something that you can also do with Docker Compose. Uh, when you have con two containers that where one depends on another one starting, you can actually configure this waiting logic in the Docker Compose. Okay, so now let's see actually that the Docker containers are running. So we have both of them. Here you see the container names that Docker Compose gave them. And one thing here, 
to note is that the Mongo Express actually started on port 8081 inside the container. So we can see that here. So we are opening a port 8080 on my laptop that actually forwards the request to container at port 8081. Just so that you don't get confused because it was 8080 on the slides. So now that we have restarted the containers, let's actually check the first one, which is Mongo Express. So it's running on 8080. In the previous example, we created a database and the collection, which is gone because we restarted the container. This is actually another very important concept of containers to understand. When you restart a container, everything that you configured in that container's application is gone. So data is lost, so to say. There is no data persistence in the containers itself. Of course, that is very inconvenient. You want to have some persistence, especially when you're working with a database. And there is a concept we're going to learn later called volumes uh, that makes it possible to have persistency between the container restarts. OK, so let's actually create the database again because we need it. And inside the database, we had actually users collection let's create that one as well and that is empty now let's actually start our application and there you go so now if i were to modify this one here and update i should see the updated entry here so the connectivity with MongoDB works. So now what do I do if I want to stop those containers? Of course, I could go there and say Docker stop and I can provide all the IDs as we did previously or with Docker compose, it's actually easier. I can do Docker compose again, specify the file and instead of up, I'm going to say down. And that will go through all the containers and shut them all. And in addition to removing the containers or stopping them removing the containers, it also removes the network. So the next time we restart it, it's going to recreate. So let's actually check that. Docker network ls. That default, my app default network is gone. And when I do up, See, it gets recreated. That should give you a good idea of what Docker Compose is and how to use it. The next, we're going to build our own Docker image from our Node.js JavaScript application. So now let's consider the following scenario. You have developed an application feature, you have tested it, and now you're ready to deploy it, right? To deploy it, your application should be packaged into its own Docker container. So this means that we are going to build a Docker image from our JavaScript Node.js backend application and prepare it to be deployed on some environment. To review this diagram that we saw at the beginning of the tutorial, so we have developed a JavaScript application, we have used the MongoDB Docker container to use it, and now it's time to commit it to the Git. Right. So in this case, we're going to simulate these uh, steps on the local environment, but still I'm going to show you how these steps actually work. So after commit, you have a continuous integration that runs. So the question is, what does actually Jenkins do with this application? When it builds the application, so the JavaScript application using the uh, NPM build, etc., it packages it then in a Docker image and then pushes it into a Docker repository. So we're going to actually simulate what Jenkins does with their application and how it actually packages it into a Docker image on the local environment. So I'm going to do all this on my laptop, but it's basically the same thing that Jenkins will do. And then on later step, we can actually push the built image into a Docker repository. In order to build a Docker image from an application, we basically have to 
copy the contents of that application into the Docker file. It could be an artifact that we built. In our case, we just have three files, so we're gonna copy them directly in the image and we're gonna configure it. And in order to do that, we're gonna use a blueprint for building images, which is called a Docker file. So let's actually see what is a Docker file and how it actually looks like. So as I mentioned, Docker file is a blueprint for creating Docker images. A syntax of a Docker file is super simple. So the first line of every Docker file is from image. So whatever image you are building, you always want to base it on another image. In our case, we have a JavaScript application with Node.js backend. So we are going to need Node inside of our container so that it can run our Node application instead of basing it on a Linux Alpine or some other lower level image because then we would have to install Node ourselves on it. So we are taking a ready Node image. And in order to see that, let's actually go to Docker Hub and search node here. And here you see there is a ready node image that we can base our own image from. So here we have a lot of different texts, so we can actually use one specific one or we can just go with the latest if we don't specify any tag. So what that actually means, basing our own image on a node image, is that we are going to have node installed inside of our image. So when we start a container and we actually get a terminal of the container, we can see that node command is available because there is node installed there. This is what from node actually gives us. So the next one is we can configure environmental variables inside our Docker file. Now, as you know, we have already done this in the using the Docker run commands or the Docker compose. So this will be just an alternative to defining environmental variables in a Docker compose, for example. I would say it's better to define the environmental variables externally in a Docker compose file, because if something changes, you can actually override it. You can change the Docker compose file and override it instead of rebuilding the image. But this is an option. So this env command basically would translate to setting the environmental variables inside of the image environment. The next one is run. So all these capital case words that you see from env and run, they're basically part of a syntax of a Docker file. So using run, basically you can execute any kind of Linux commands. So you see make directory is a Linux command that creates a home slash home slash app um, directory. Very important to note here. This directory is gonna live inside of a container. So when I start a container from this image, the ho slash home slash app directory will be created inside of the container and not on my laptop, not on the host. So all these commands that you have in Docker file will apply to the container environment. None of them will be affecting my host environment or my laptop environment. So with run, basically you can execute any Linux commands that you want. So that's probably one of the most used ones. And we also have a copy command. Now you would probably ask, I can execute a copy command, a Linux copy command using run. Yes, you could. But the difference here is that, as I said, all these commands in run, for example, they apply to, they get executed inside of the container. The copy command that you see here, it actually uh, executes on the host. And you see the first parameter is dot and the second parameter is slash home slash app. So source and the target. So I can copy files that I have on my host inside of that container image. Because if I were to execute run cp source destination that command would execute inside of the docker container but i have the files that i want to copy on my host and the last one so from and cmd or command is always part of docker file what command does is basically executes an entry point linux command 
So this line with the command actually translates to node server JS. So remember here, we actually do node server JS. So we start a node server with the node JS. This is exactly what it does, but inside of the container. So once we copy our server JS and other files inside of a container, we can then execute node server JS. And we are able to do it because we are basing on the node image that already has node pre-installed. And we are gonna see all this in action. So another question here, what is the difference between run and CMD? You could, I could also say run node server JS. The difference again is that CMD is an entry point command. So you can have multiple run commands with different Linux commands, but CMD is just one. And that marks for Docker file that this is the command that you want to execute as an entry point. So that basically runs the server and that's it. So now let's actually create the Docker file. And just like the Docker compose file, Docker file is part of the application code. So I'm gonna create a new file here and I'm gonna paste here the contents. So again, we are basing off node image and actually instead of just having the latest node, I'm gonna specify a node version. So I'm going to take 13 minus Alpine. So all these that you see here are tags. So I can use any of them as a tag. So I'm gonna say 13 minus Alpine like this. So this is gonna be a specific node image that I'm gonna use as my base image. Let's actually stop here for a moment and take a little bit of a deep dive on this line. So since we saw that the Docker file is a blueprint for any Docker image, that should actually mean that every Docker image that there is on Docker Hub should be built on its own Docker file, right? So if we actually go to, let's actually look at one of the latest versions, which is 13 minus Alpine, and then let's click inside. And as you see, this specific image has its own Docker file. And here, as you see, we have the same from that we just saw. And this is what this node official image is based off, which is a base image Alpine 3.10, right? And then we have this environmental variable set and all these Linux commands using run and some other environmental variable. And you have this entry point, which is a script. So you can also execute the whole shell script instead of separate commands. And you have this final command, right? So you don't have to understand any of this. I just want to demonstrate that every image is based off another base image, right? So in order to actually visually comprehend how this layer stacking works with images, let's consider this simplified visualization. So our own image that we're building app with the version 1.0 is gonna be based on a node image with a specific version. That's why we're gonna specify from node 13 Alpine. And the node 13 Alpine image, as we saw in the Docker file, is based on Alpine base image with the version 3.10. That's why it specifies from Alpine 3.10. So Alpine is a lightweight base image, then we install node on top of it, and then we install our own application on top of it. And basically this is how all the images are built. So now let's go back and complete our Docker file. So we have the from specified, we have the environmental variables specified, and in just a second, we're gonna actually see these commands in action. So let's copy that, and this is also very important. Docker file has to be called exactly like that. You can't just give it any name. It is always called Docker file, starting with a capital D and that's it. It's a simple text file. So just save it like this. And here you even see the highlighting and this Docker icon. So now that we have a Docker file ready, let's see how to actually use it. So how do we build an image out of it? So in order to build an image using a Docker file, we have to provide two parameters 
One is we want to give our image a name and a tag, just like all the other images have. So we are going to do it using minus T. So we're going to call our image my app and we're going to give it a tag of 1.0. The tag could be anything. You can even call it actually version one. It wouldn't matter. So we're going to do 1.0. And the second required parameter actually is a location of a Docker file because we want to tell Docker here, build an image using this Docker file. And in this case, because we're in the same folder as the Docker file, we're just going to say current directory. When we execute this, we're going to see that image is built. And this is an ID of the image that was built. Because I already have node 13 Alpine on my laptop, this just use the, the one I have lying around locally. For you, if it's the first time, you will actually see that it's pulling node image from the Docker Hub. So now with the Docker images, I can actually see that my image is here. It says created two days ago. I don't know why, but anyways, so I have the image name, which is this one here. And I have the name of the image and the tag of the image. So if we go back to this diagram that we saw in the review, so basically we've gone all these steps or we have simulated some of the steps. We built the JavaScript application using a Docker containers. And once the, the application is ready, let's say we made the commit and we're, we just simulated what Jenkins server also does. So what Jenkins does is actually it takes the Docker file that we create. So we have to commit the Docker file into the repository with the code and Jenkins will then build a Docker image based on the Docker file. And what is an important point here is that usually you don't develop alone. You are in the team. So other people might want to have access to that up to date image of your application that you developed. It could be a tester maybe who wants to pull that image and test it locally, or you want that image to be deployed on a development server, right? And in order to do that, you have to actually share the image. So it is pushed into a Docker repository. And from there, either people can take it. For example, a tester maybe want to download the image from there and test it locally, or a development server can actually pull it from there. So let's actually just run a container. I'm just going to say docker run the image name, obviously, and a tag like this. And in this case, I'm not going to specify any other options because we just want to see what's going on inside of the container. So I'm just going to run it. Okay. So the problem is that it can't find the server JS file, which is actually logical because we are not telling it to look in the correct directory. So since we're copying all the resources in this home slash home slash app directory, server JS is going to be there as well. And this is another topic. Whenever you adjust a Docker file, you have to rebuild an image because the old image cannot be overwritten, so to say. So what I'm going to do now is actually, I'm going to delete the one that I built. So I'm going to, I'm going to actually take the image. This is how you delete an image, but I can delete it because as it, as it says, the Docker is used by a stopped container. So if I do Docker PS minus a, actually let's grab to my app like this. I have to first delete the container. So this is how you delete a container. It's Docker RM. And once I've deleted the container, I can delete an image. So the image deletion is RMI like this. So if I do images now, I see my image isn't there. Okay. So we've modified the Docker file. So let's rebuild it now. So Docker build again. And let's see the image is here. So let's start it again. So it's my app 1.0 and let's run it. 
And as you see, the problem is fixed, app listening on port 3000. So our app is running. So this one here, my app 1.0. First of all, we can see the logs here, like this. We see that the app is listening on port 3000. We know everything is cool. To actually just get a little bit more inside, let's enter the containers or let's get the terminal, the command line terminal of the container and look around there. So I'm gonna say docker exec interactive terminal. I'm gonna specify the container ID in bash like this. And since bin bash doesn't work, we can actually try shell. So this is something you will also encounter because some containers do not have bash installed. So we'll have to connect using bin sh. So one of them has to work always. So let's see in which directory we are. So we are in the root directory and we see our virtual file system there. And as you see, the cursor changed as well. So that means we're inside of a container. So now let's actually check some of the stuff. So first of all, we specified some environmental variables here in the Docker file. And this means that these environmental variables have to be set inside the Docker environment. So if we do env, we actually see the MongoDB username this one here and MongoDB password are set. And there are some other environmental variables automatically set. We don't care about them. So another thing we can check is this directory because remember, because with this line, we actually created this slash home slash app directory. So let's see slash home slash app. And as you can see, the directory was created. And with the next line, we copied everything in the current folder. So if we actually go and see reveal in finder. So this is where the Docker file resides. So basically we copied everything that is inside of this directory. So all of this into the container. Now we don't actually need to have Docker file and Docker compose and uh, this other stuff in here because the only thing we need are the JavaScript files or if we build a JavaScript application artifact, just the artifact. So let's go ahead and improve that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create an app directory and I'm going to copy just the files that I'm going to need for starting an application inside of a container. So I'm going to take those and the images as well. So all these are just external ones. We don't need them there and images, the index HTML file, package JSON, server JS and the node modules are inside of app. So what we can do it now is instead of copying the whole directory where, where the Docker file is, I just want to copy all the contents of app folder. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say copy all the app contents. And again, because we modified a Docker file, we need to recreate the image in order to leave the Docker container terminal. You can actually exit. So now we are on the host again. So if I do Docker images again, I have to first delete the container and then image. But in order to delete the container, I have to first stop it. So now I can remove the container and now I can actually remove the image that the container was based on. And let's check again. So let's ex execute that build command again. So now that we have the image built, let's actually run it. So I'm going to say my app 1.0. And of course I could have executed with a minus D in a detached mode. It doesn't matter now. And if I do a Docker PS, I see my um, image container running. And now let's actually enter the container again. So T. And as we learned, it was in SH. And again, we're going to see the home app 
and here we just have the contents of app directory so no unnecessary docker file docker compose etc files which is actually how it's supposed to be or as i said because i just had a couple of files here i copied all of them but usually if you have this huge application you would want to compress them and package them into an artifact and then copy that artifact into a docker image container okay but as i said this was just for demonstration purposes because I just wanted to show you um, how you can actually start it as a container and how it should look inside. And in this case, we improved a couple of things, but usually we would start this container from a Docker Compose as well, together with all the other Docker images that the application uses. And it also doesn't have any ports open. So uh, this is just for demonstration purposes. So in this video, we're going to create a private repository for Docker images on AWS ECR. There are many more options for Docker registries, among them Nexus and DigitalOcean. So we're going to see how to create a registry there, build and tag an image so that we can push them into that repository. And in order to push the images into a private repository, you first have to log into that repository. So let's see how it all works. So the first step is to actually create a private repository for Docker. It's also called Docker registry. In this case, we're going to do it on AWS. So let's see. So I already have an account on AWS. So the service that we're going to use is called elastic container registry. So ECR Docker container registry. And because I don't have a repository there yet, I am presenting with the screen. So in order to create a repository, click on get started. And here we have a repository name. And we're actually going to name it the name of the application that we have. So I'm actually going to name it my app. This is the domain of the registry from AWS. And this is the repository name, which is the same as my image name. And don't worry about the other stuff right now and just create a repository. It's as simple as that. Now, one thing I think specific to Amazon Container Service is that here you create a Docker repository per image. So you don't have a repository where you have, where you can actually push multiple images of different applications, but rather for each image, you have its own repository and you go inside of the repository here. It's empty now, but what you store in a repository are the different tags or different versions of the same image. So this is how the Amazon container service actually works. There are other Docker registries that work differently. For example, you create a repository and you can just throw all of your container images inside of that one repository. So I think this is more or less specific for AWS. So anyways, we have a repository, which is called my app. And let's actually see how we can push the image that we have locally. So actually check that once more. So we want to push this image here into that repository. So how do we do that? If you click on this one, the view push commands will be highlighted. This is different for each registry, but basically what you need to do in order to push an image into a repository are two things. One, you have to log in into the private repository because you have to authenticate yourself. So if you're pushing from your local laptop or local environment, you have to tell that private repository, Hey, I have access to it. This is my credentials. If a Docker image is built and pushed from a Jenkins server, then you have to give Jenkins credentials to log in into the repository. So Docker login is always the first step that you need to do. So here AWS actually provides a Docker login command for AWS. So it doesn't say Docker login, but in the background, it uses one. So I'm going to execute this login command for AWS Docker repository. Uh, so in the background, it uses actually Docker login. 
to authenticate. So in order to be able to execute this, you need to have AWS command line interface and the credentials configured for it. So if you don't, I'm going to put a link to the guide of how to do that in the description. I have configured both of them so I can execute this command and I should be logged in successfully to the Docker repository. So now I have authenticated myself to the Docker repository here. So I'm able to push the image that I have locally to that repository. But before I do that, there is one step I need to do. So I've already built my image, so that's fine. And now I have to tag my image. And if this command here looks a little bit too complicated for you or too strange, let's actually go and look at image naming concepts in Docker repositories. So this is the naming in Docker registries. This is how it works. The first part of the image name, the image full name is the registry domain. So that is the host, port, etc. slash repository or image name and the tag. Now you may be wondering, every time we were pulling an image out of Docker Hub, we actually never had this complex long name of the image, right? So when we were pulling an image, it looked like this, Docker pull Mongo 4.2. The thing is with Docker Hub, we're actually able to pull an image with a shorthand without having to specify a registry domain. But this command here is actually a shorthand for this command. What actually gets executed in the background when we say docker pull mongo is docker pull the registry domain. So docker.io slash library is a registry domain. Then you have the image name and then you have the tag. So because we were, we were working with Docker Hub, we were able to use a shortcut, so to say. In the private registries, we can just skip that part because there is no default configuration for it. So in our case, in AWS ECR, what we are going to do is we're going to execute Docker pull the full registry domain of the repository. This is what we're going to see here and a tag. And this is how AWS just generates the Docker registry name. That's why we see this long image name with the tag here. And we have to tag our image like this. So let's go back and take a look at our images, our image that we built again. And under the repository, it says my app. Now, the problem is we can just push an image with this name because when we say Docker push my app like this, Docker wouldn't know to which repository we're trying to push. It, by default, it will actually assume we're trying to push to Docker Hub, but it's not going to work, obviously, because we want to push it to AWS. So in order to tell Docker, you know what, I want this image to be pushed to AWS repository with the name my app, we have to tag the image. So we have to include that information in the name of the image. And that is why we have to tag the image. Tag basically means that we are renaming our image to include the repository domain or the address and the name. Okay. And AWS already gives us the command that we can execute. We want to use the specific version. So I'm going to use 1.0 in both. So what this is going to do is it's going to rename. This is what tag does my app 1.0. This is what we have locally. This is what the name is to this one here. So let's execute that and let's see what the outcome is. And as you see, it took the image that we had, it made a copy and renamed it into this one. So these two are identical images. They're just called in a different way. And now when we go back, we see the Docker push command. So basically this thing here is the same as Docker push and name of the image and the tag. So this push command will tell Docker, you know what? I want you to take the image with tag 1.0 and push it into a repository at this address. 
So when I execute this command, see the push command will actually push those layers of the Docker image one by one. This is the same thing as when we are pulling it. We also pulled the images layer by layer. And this is what happens in the reverse direction when we push it. So this is also going to take a little bit. Great. So the push command was complete and we should be able to see that image in the AWS repository now. So if I go inside, see, I have image tag with 1.0. This is our tag here and push the time, the digest, which is the unique hash of that image and the image URI, which is again, the name of the image using the, the repository address, image name or repository name in this case, and the tag. So now let's say I made some changes in the Docker file. You know, let's say I renamed this home uh, slash home slash app to node app like this. Or what could also lead to need to recreate an image is obviously when I change something in the code, right? So, you know, let's say I were to delete this line because I don't want to console log to be in my code. And now I have a different version of the application where I have changes in the application. So now I want to have those changes in the new Docker image. So now let's build a new Docker image out of it. So Docker build, let's call it my app with a version 1.1 and a path to a Docker file. And now I have a second image, which is called my app with version 1.1. So now again, because I want to push this to a repository, I have to rename it to include the repository address inside of it. So I'm going to do Docker tag. The first parameter is the image that I want to rename. And the second one is the name of that image, a new name. So it's going to be the same as the previous one because the repository name and the address is the same. Remember, we have one repository for one image, but for different versions. So we are building a version 1.1. So it should end up in the same repository. So now here we have 1.1. And if I tag that and images, I have a second image here. So I'm going to copy that and I'm going to do Docker build. And do not forget the tag. It's important because it's part of the complete name. Sorry, it's Docker push. And now some of the layers that I already pushed are there. Only the ones that changed are being repushed, so to say. And also know that I just have to do Docker login once at the beginning, and then I can pull and push images uh, from this repository as many times as I want. So Docker login is done once. So now that is complete. Let's actually reload this. So my repository now has two versions. So this is pretty practical if you are, for example, testing with different versions and you want to have a history of those image tags. If you want to, for example, test a previous version. And I think in AWS, the repos each repository has a capacity of holding up to 1000 uh, image versions. So for example, my app here, you can have thousand different tags or of the same image. Okay. So now again, to compare it to the initial diagram that we saw for this complete flow, let's actually switch back to it quickly. So here, what we did is basically simulate how Jenkins would push an image to a Docker repository. So whatever we did on our laptop will be the same commands executed on a Docker, uh, on the Jenkins server. And again, 
Jenkins user or Jenkins server user has to have credentials to the Docker repository to execute Docker login. Depending on the registry or repository, the configuration will look different and Jenkins needs to tag the image and then push it to the repository. And this is how it, it's done. And the next step, of course, we need to use that image that is lying now in the repository and we're gonna see how it's pulled from that repository. And again, we're going to do it on the local environment, but it's the same thing that a development server or any other environment will actually execute. So in this video, we're going to see how to deploy an application that we built into a Docker image. So after you package your application in a Docker image and save it in the private repository, you need to somehow deploy it on a development server or integration server or whatever other environment. And we're gonna use Docker Compose to deploy that application. So let's imagine we have logged in to a development server and we want to run our image that we just push the repository, so our my app image and the MongoDB image, uh, both the database and the Mongo Express on the development server. So the my app image will be pulled from private repository of AWS the, and the two Mongo containers will be pulled from the Docker Hub. So let's see actually how that would work. So usually again, you have developed your application, you are done with it and you have created uh, your own Docker image, right? Now, in order to start an application on development server, you would need all the containers that make up that application environment. Okay, so we have MongoDB and Mongo Express already. So what we are gonna do is here, we're gonna add a new container in the list, which is gonna be our own image. So let's go ahead and copy the image from our repository. So let's actually use the 1.0. So again, remember we said that this image name is a shortcut for having a docker.io.library slash mongo with a, like a specific version. So instead of that, because we are pulling these images from a Docker hub, we can actually skip that repository domain in front of the images. But here, because we are pulling it from a private repository. So if we were to specify our image like this, Docker will think that our image resides on Docker Hub. So we try to pull it from Docker Hub. And of course it won't find it because we have to tell Docker, go and look at this repository with this repository name and this tag. And of course, in order to be able to pull this image or the Docker Compose to be able to pull this image, the environment where you're executing this Docker Compose file has to be logged into a Docker repository. So here as the development server has to pull the image from the repository, what we would need to do on the development server is actually do a Docker login before we execute the Docker Compose. And obviously you don't need a Docker login for Docker Hub. Those Mongo images will be pulled freely. Okay, so the next thing that we have to configure are the ports because obviously we want to open the ports. If we go back, we see that our application runs on port 3000. So the port of the container or the, where the container is listening on is 3000. And here we can open the port on the host machine. So it's going to be 3000 map to 3000. We have actually the environment variables inside of the Docker file, but obviously we could have configured them in the Docker compose just like this. So it's an alternative. So this will be a complete Docker compose file that will be used on a development server to deploy all the, all the applications inside. So again, if we're trying to simulate a development server, the first step will be to do the Docker login. In this case, you have this own command uh, for logging into the AWS repository, which I have done already in this terminal. 
So the next step is to have the Docker Compose file available on this development server because we have to execute the Docker Compose file. Because we're simulating here, the way I would do it is I'm going to create a Mongo YAML file in the current directory where I am. I'm going to copy this and save. So now I have my Mongo YAML file and now we can start all three containers using docker compose command minus f up and here we see that app started on 3000 and mongodb and express started as well so let's check again now and here we saw the database is lost every time we recreate a container. And of course that's not good. And we're going to learn how to preserve the database data when the container restarts using Docker volumes in the later tutorials, because this is not an ideal state. Okay. So now that we have a database in a collection, let's actually refresh and our application works as well. Let's check. Awesome. So our application works. Let's refresh this one as well. And there is actually one thing that I needed to change in the code to connect Node.js with uh, MongoDB. So let's actually go and look at that. These are my handlers in you know, Node.js where I connect to the MongoDB database. So the URIs are the same. And what I changed here is that it was a local host before. So instead of local host, I changed it to MongoDB because this actually is a name of the container or of the service that we specify here. So this actually leads back to the Docker network and how Docker Compose takes care of it is that in the URI or when I connect one application in a Docker container with another one in another Docker container, I don't have to use this uh, local host anymore. Actually, I wouldn't even need to use the port even because I have all that information. So the host name and the port number in that configuration. So my application will be able to connect to MongoDB using the service name. And because of that, you don't have to specify here a local host and the port number, which is actually even more advantage when you consider using Docker containers to run all of your applications because it makes the connectivity between them even more easier. And that actually concludes the, this uh, diagram that we saw previously. We have gone through all of the steps where we saw uh, how to develop uh, a JavaScript application locally with Docker containers. Then we saw how to build them into an image, uh, just like a continuous integration build will do it. Then we pushed it into a private repository and we simulated a development server where we pulled the image from a private repository and the other images from the Docker hub, where we started the whole application setup with our uh, own application and the two Mongo applications uh, using a Docker compose, which is how you would deploy an application on a dev server so that now testers or other developers will be able to um, access the development server and actually try out the application that you just deployed. Or you can also use it for demos. So in this video, we're going to learn about Docker volumes. In a nutshell, Docker volumes are used for data persistence in Docker. So for example, if you have databases or other stateful applications, you would want to use Docker volumes for that. So what are the specific use cases when you need Docker volumes? So a container runs on a host. Let's say we have a database container and a container has a virtual file system where the data is usually stored. But here there is no persistence. So if I were to remove the container or stop it and restart the container, then the data in this virtual file system is gone and it starts from a fresh state which is obviously not very practical because I want to save the changes that my application is making 
in the database. And that's where I need Docker volumes. So what are the Docker volumes exactly? So on a host, we have a physical file system, right? And the way volumes work is that we plug the physical file system path. It could be a folder, a directory, and we plug it into the containers file system path. So in simple terms, a directory a folder on a host file system is mounted into a directory or folder in the virtual file system of Docker. So what happens is that when a container writes to its file system, it gets replicated or automatically written on the host file system directory and vice versa. So if I were to change something on the host file system, it automatically appears in the container as well. So that's why when a container restarts, even if it starts from a fresh state in its own virtual file system, it gets the data automatically from the, from the host because the data is still there. And that's how data is populated on the startup of a container every time you restart. Now there are different types of Docker volumes and so different ways of creating them. Usually the way to create Docker volumes is using Docker run command. So in the Docker run, there's an option called minus V. And this is where we define the connection or the reference between the host directory and the container directory. And this type of volume definition is called a host volume. And the main characteristic of this one is that you decide where on the host file system that reference is made. So which folder on the host file system you mount into the container. So the second type is where you create a volume just by referencing the container directory. So you don't specify which uh, directory on the host should be mounted, but that's taking care of the Docker itself. So that directory is first of all, automatically created by Docker under the var lib docker volumes. So for each container, there will be a folder generated that gets mounted automatically to the container. And this type of volumes are called anonymous volumes because you don't have a reference to this automatically generated folder. Basically you just have to know the path. And the third volume type is actually an improvement of the anonymous volumes. And it specifies the name of the folder on the host file system. And the name is up to you. It's just to reference the directory. And that type of volumes are called named volumes. So in this case, compared to anonymous volumes, you, ha you can actually reference that volume just by name. So you don't have to know exactly the path. So from these three types, the mostly used one and the one that you should be using in production is actually the named volumes because there are additional benefits to letting Docker actually manage those uh, volume directories on the host. Now this showed how to create Docker volumes using Docker run commands. But if you're using Docker compose, it's actually the same. So this actually shows how to use volume definitions in a Docker compose. And this is pretty much the same as in Docker run commands. So we have volumes attribute and underneath you define your volume definition, just like you would in this minus V option. And here we use a named volume. So DB dash data will be the name reference name that you can just think of it could be anything. And in var lib mysql data is the path in the container. Then you may have some other containers. And at the end, so on the same level as the services, you would actually list all the volumes that you have defined. You define a list of volumes that you want to mount into the containers. So if you were to create volumes for different containers, you would list them all here. And on the container level, then you actually define under which path that specific volume can be mounted. And the benefit of that is that you can actually mount a reference of the same uh, folder on a host to more than one containers. And that would be beneficial if those containers need to share the data. In this case, you would mount the same volume name or reference to two different containers, and you can mount them into different path inside of the container even. In this video, we are going to look at Docker volumes in practice 
And this is a simple Node.js MongoDB application uh, that we're going to attach the volume to so that we don't lose the database data every time we restart the MongoDB container. So let's head over to the console and I'm going to start the MongoDB with the Docker Compose. So this is how the Docker Compose looks like. We're going to start the MongoDB uh, container and the Mongo Express container so that we have a UI to it. So I'm going to execute the Docker Compose, which is going to start MongoDB and the Mongo Express. So when it started, I'm going to check that Mongo Express is running on port 8080. And here we see just the default databases. So these are just created by default on startup. Um, and we're going to create our own one for the Node.js application. And inside of that database, I'm going to create users collection. So these are the prerequisites or these are the things that my Node.js application needs. So this one here, in order to connect to the database MyDB, this is what we just created, MyDB, and inside of that to the collection called users. So let's start the application which is running on port 3000 so here. And this is our app, which when I edit something here, will write the changes to my database. Now, if I were to restart now the MongoDB container, I would lose all this data. So because of that, we're going to use named volumes inside of the Docker Compose file to persist all this data in the MongoDB. So let's head over to the Docker Compose. So the first step is to define what volumes I'm going to be using in any of my containers. And I'm going to do that on the services level. So here um, I define the list of all the volumes that I'm going to need in any of my containers. And since we need data persistence for MongoDB, we're going to create a Mongo data volume here. Now, this is going to be the name of the volume reference, uh, but we also need to provide here a driver local. So the actual storage path that we're going to see later once it's created, it is actually created by Docker itself. And this is a kind of an information, additional information for Docker to create that physical storage on a local file system. So once we have a name reference to the volume defined, we can actually use it in the container. So here I'm going to say volumes. And here I will define a mapping between the Mongo data volume that we have on our host. And the second one will be the path inside of the MongoDB container. It has to be the path where MongoDB explicitly persists its data. So for example, if you check it out online, you see that the default path where MongoDB stores its data is data slash data slash DB. And we can actually check that out. So if I say Docker PS and go inside the container, it's minus IT. I can actually see data DB. And here is all the data that MongoDB actually holds. But this is, of course, only the container. So when the container restarts, the data get regenerated. So nothing persists here. So this is the path inside of the container, not on my host, that we need to reference in the volumes here. So we're attaching our volume on the host to data slash data slash DB inside of a container. So for example, for MySQL, it's going to be um, var lib MySQL. For Postgres, it's also going to be var lib uh, Postgres SQL uh, slash data. So each database will have its own. So you'd have to actually find the right one. So what this means is that all the data with, that we just saw here, all of this will be replicated on a container startup on our host, on this persistent volume that we defined here and vice versa, meaning when a container restarts, all the data that is here 
will be replicated inside of that directory inside of a container. So now that we have defined that, let's actually restart the Docker Compose. And restart it. So once we create the data, and I'm going to collection, and let's actually change this one. Let's travel here and update it. So we have the data here. So now that we have the persistent volume defined, if I were to restart all these containers, this data should be persisted. So on the next restart, I should see the database, my DB collection and the entry here. So let's do that. I'm going to do down. Great. So let's check. See the database is here, the collection is here and the entry has persisted. So now let's actually see where the Docker volumes are located on our local machine. And that actually differs between the operating systems. For example, on a Windows laptop or a computer, uh, the path of the Docker volume will be at program data docker slash volumes. The program data docker folder actually contains all the other container information. So you would see other folders in this Docker uh, directory besides the volumes. On Linux, the path is actually slash var lib docker volumes, which is comparable to the Windows path. So this is where the Docker saves all this configuration and the data. And on the Mac, it's also the same one. Inside of this volumes directory, you actually have a list of all the volumes that one or many containers are using. And each volume has its own hash which is or which has to be unique and then slash underscore data will actually contain all the files and all the data that is uh, persisted. Let's head over to the command line and, and actually see um, the volumes that we persisted for MongoDB. Now an interesting uh, note here is that if I were to go to this path that I just showed you in the presentation, which is var lib docker, See, there is no such a directory, so that could be a little, little bit confusing. But the way it works on Mac specifically, on Linux, you would actually have that path directly on your host. But on Mac, it's a little bit different. So basically what happens is that Docker for Mac application seems to uh, actually create a Linux VM uh, in the background and store all the Docker information or Docker data about the containers and the volumes, etc inside of that VM's storage. So if we execute this command here, so this is actually the physical storage on my laptop that I have where all the data is stored. But if I execute this command, I actually get the terminal of that VM. And inside here, if I look, I have a, a virtual different virtual file system and I can find that path that I showed you here. So it's var leap docker see so i have all this docker information here i have the containers folder and i have volumes folder so this is the one we need so, so that let's actually go to the volumes and this is a list of volumes that um, i have uh, created and this is the one that came from our docker compose right this is the name of our app. This is the, this is what Docker Compose actually takes as the name. You can actually take a look here. So when it's creating these containers, it depends this name as a prefix, and then there is MongoDB. And our volume has the same pattern. It has the prefix, and then MongoData. This is the name that we defined here. So now, if we look inside of that MongoData volume directory we see that underscore data. This would be the anonymous volumes. So basically here you don't have a name reference, it's just some random uh, unique ID, but it's the same kind of directory as this one here. The difference being that this one has a name. 
So it's more, it's easier to reference it with a name. So this is anonymous volume, this is a named volume. But the contents will be used in the same way. Um, so here, as you see in this underscore data, we have all the data that MongoDB uses. So this will be where it gets the default databases and the changes that we make through our application inside. And if I go inside of the container, so remember this volume is attached to MongoDB and is replicated inside of the container under path slash data slash db. So if we go inside of the container, actually leave it here, good ps. db we'll see actually the same kind of data here so we have all this index and collection um, files just like we did in this one so now whenever we make changes to our application for example we change it to smith whatever and this will make the container update its data and that will cascade into this volumes directory that we have here. So that on the next startup of a container, when the slash data slash db is totally empty, it will actually populate this directory with the data from this uh, persistent volume. So that we will see all the data that we uh, created through our application again on startup. And that's how Docker volumes work. In order to end that screen session that we just started, because Exit doesn't work in this case uh, somehow. On Mac, you can actually click on Control A K and then just type Y and the session will be closed. So when you do screen LS, you should see actually it's terminating. Congratulations, you made it till the end. I hope you learned a lot and got some valuable knowledge from this course. Now that you've learned all about containers and Docker technology, you can start building complex applications with tens or even hundreds of containers. Of course, these containers would need to be deployed across multiple servers in a distributed way. You can imagine what overhead and headache it would be to manually manage those hundreds of containers. So as a next step, you can learn about container orchestration tools and Kubernetes in particular, which is the most popular tool to automate this task. If you want to learn about Kubernetes, be sure to check out my tutorials on that topic and subscribe to my channel for more content on modern DevOps tools. Also, if you want to stay connected, you can follow me on social media or join the private Facebook group. I would love to see you there. So thank you for watching and see you in the next video.